Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Danny Heinsen. Um, I'm from the uh, ISIS uh, facility. Uh, this is my first time at No Bugs, so it's very nice to be able to uh, do a talk and uh, share with you some of the work I've been doing. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm a, um, I'm a software engineer in the uh, Mantid data reduction uh, team, working on that piece of software. Um, I work mainly on um, corrections. Um, I'm going to talk to you now about some work I've been doing on uh, multiple scattering corrections. Um, so that's um, one of the corrections performed in the data reduction workflow for uh, some of the instruments at ISIS. Um, so the plan is something like this. I'm going to begin by um, talking about um, what multiple scattering is and why it's important that we correct for it. Um, and I'm then going to move on to talk about um, fairly old um, piece of software called Discus, uh, which is able to uh, simulate and calculate multiple scattering um, effects. And I'm going to talk about the work I've done to um, extend the life of uh, that piece of software by uh, moving it into Mantid. Um, and I've also extended the sort of feature set in the software as well. Um, so um, I'll leave you to read the rest. but. Um, I guess if, uh, if multiple scattering corrections aren't necessarily your thing, I will also be uh, sort of touching on a few more general points of interest. So um, I'm, I guess as I go through, I'll be sort of talking about a few features in Mantid, um, and I'll also be talking a little bit about some of the challenges in sort of working with uh, legacy software and updating it. Um, so to begin with, um, so, um, the reason we need to worry about multiple scattering is that uh, most scattering theory that we use to extract science from um, scattering measurements, most of that theory is based on the assumption that um, uh, neutrons or X-rays are scattered just once um, in the sample as, as, it, as they go from their journey from the, the beam through to the detector. So that means that um, we need to remove um, neutrons that have been scattered more than once, such as this uh, path that I've shown on the screen. Uh, that's a, a doubly scattered uh, neutron path. Um, or perhaps it's a triply scattered one even, um, as it goes through um, the greatly enlarged sample on its journey from the, uh, the beam to the detector. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the problem. Uh, and hopefully that's, that's fairly simple. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Discus. Um, so this, um, this is a, a, a program uh, which can calculate multiple scattering effects. And it was, uh, it was written in uh, 1974 uh, by somebody called Mike Hinton. So um, that makes it 48 years old, um, which is something I can tell you very quickly because uh, the software is the same age as me. Um, so um, if, uh, if you happen to see me after the talk, then uh, do feel free to tell me that I I don't look that old. That's always uh, greatly appreciated. Um, so uh, Mike Johnson, uh, it won't surprise you to hear, uh, is now retired, but he's still around, still comes into the lab uh, on occasion, once or twice a year. Um, so when he wrote this piece of software, um, he did this over 10 years before ISIS opened. So he was based at the site where ISIS now is, and he eventually went on to work uh, at ISIS. But at this point, um, there were still um, neutron scattering experiments going on at the Harwell site where ISIS is now based, but at the time there were other um, neutron sources. So this is before the spallation source was built. So uh, for example, there was a reactor source at the time. Um, and I guess, uh, yeah, certain features of the program uh, reflect instruments you might typically find a reactor source. Um, so the program uses a Monte Carlo integration method. Uh, it uh, takes the inputs on the left side of the arrow up there um, and produces uh, simulated multiply scattered intensities um, at uh, certain detector positions, which we've told us about. Um, just one little bit of jargon. Uh, if, if you're familiar with uh, scattering theory, you'll recognize this um, S Q omega function I've got on the left there. So that's commonly known as the uh, structure factor or the scattering law for a particular material. Um, if you're not familiar with the theory, I will give you a very hand wavy approximate definition of what that means, because I'm going to mention it again. 
So um, that uh, very roughly tells you the probability of a neutron undergoing a particular change in direction and a particular change in energy uh, during a, a scattering event in the, in the sample. Um, so the program was written in Fortran. It was uh, developed and run on an IBM mainframe computer at Harwell. Um, and it includes a few um, assumptions. So I'm not gonna go through in detail. You can see them on the screen there, but perhaps I'll just pick out one of them. So it's based on an assumption that the sample is either a liquid or a, a powder, and it's not, um, uh, for example, a, a single crystal. Um, so I've just got a little um, picture here uh, to try and explain what the program does. So um, this is simplified. So I'm assuming there's just two scatters and I'm assuming uh, that the sample is just 2D, in, uh, uh, increased in size greatly again, just for clarity here. Let me just uh, play this through. Um, so uh, the simulation uh, generates lots of uh, tracks with uh, two scatters in this case in them. So those are the blue lines that you can see going from the beam through the sample up to a, a particular detector. Um, the gray lines are the maximum possible extent of each track segment, and then the actual uh, track segment's uh, length is subselected um, from that. Um, let's just start that again. Um, so at each uh, scattering point, the new scattering angle is randomly um, selected. Um, and then once the track's been formed, a set of weights are applied to each uh, track segment and uh, each scatter. So there is a, a, an attenuation factor applied to each segment. And there's then a weight depending on this uh, SQ omega function applied for each uh, change in direction. Um, and then that is repeated um, for lots of tracks, many thousands of tracks, um, and uh, that gives you a, a simulated um, intensity for each detector, and then you, you then repeat it for each detector in your instrument. So essentially, quite a heavy um, calculation. Um, so um, there is a, a more formal mathematical description of this. You'll be greatly relieved to know I'm not going to go through this, um, but there it is. So multiple scattering enthusiasts out there. So one point I will pull out of this is just right at the bottom. So um, you get some um, weights out of this calculation, which is the J quantity at the very top left. Um, uh, the meaning of this is that you multiply the, uh, the incident flux by this, this weight, and that tells you the uh, multiply scattered intensity that you get at each detector. You can, there's basically two different ways of applying this as a, a correction. You can either use a subtraction method where you subtract out all the multiple scattering orders, two, three, four, et cetera, um, from your measured signal. Uh, you've got to be careful if you do that about making sure that everything has been normalized in the same way. So your multiple scattering simulated quantity is normalized in the same way as the signal. Uh, alternatively, you can subtract it or remove it, if you like, using a, a ratio method where you um, you simulate the singly scattered intensity as well as all the multiple scattering orders and use this kind of ratio um, to, to, to remove the effect. Right, that's probably enough for maths for now. So um, before I go on to say anything more about this, I just wanted to say a little bit about this journey the code's been through, because I think it's quite an interesting sort of case and it's maybe sort of uh, replicated elsewhere. So this is a screenshot of the original Fortran code, I think it was, that uh, was written back in the 1970s. And in actual fact, a, a multi-page printout of this is actually the only uh, uh, copy of the original source code that I've got. Um, however, as you'll see, um, that's not all I had to work with. I, so I, I guess one of the points I'm trying to make here about this description is that um, maybe the, the journey the code goes through from 1974 at this point through to today, it's, it's perhaps a slightly hazardous um, journey. There's a various points in its life where this kind of program that's been written uh, on its own uh, without being in a repository, there are multiple points at which this can get lost. Um, so um, beginning with the original Fortran 4 code, uh, Mike Johnson, who wrote it, then handed it on to somebody else at ISIS to work on. So that was handed over to someone called Spencer Howells. Um, he updated the Fortran and produced a Python version of the code. 
and then so he he owned the code if you like for a, something like a 20 year period um uh he uh handed over the code uh, to somebody else who produced an, uh, an elastic version of it for use on uh, diffraction instruments. Um, that code was unfortunately lost. Um, we no longer have access to it. Um, at this point, uh, this is starting to get closer to where I come in. So uh, the, the code was originally then, uh, the program was, was, was added into Mantid originally using um, the F to Pi um, utility. Um, whereby you can run Fortran code from sort of within Python. Um, so that worked to an extent that made the functionality available uh, within Mantid. Um, however, it was something of a, a, a black box in Mantid. Um, it maybe didn't participate in a lot of the, um, I don't know, for example, the testing sort of frameworks that we've got in Mantid and wasn't being sort of as actively maintained and updated as, uh, as it would have been had it been included natively in Mantid. So um, I uh, have produced, uh, this is where I come in, in the last uh, year or so, I've ported the calculation into Mantid as a C++ um, calculation. Um, and perhaps at this point, um, now that it's uh, sitting in an open source code repository, it's perhaps found a slightly more stable sort of permanent home. Um, so, um, I just want to say a little bit about Mantid and why this is perhaps a good place for this kind of calculation to, to exist. And um, in doing the work I've done, there were lots of pre-existing features which made life a little bit easier for me. Um, so uh, Mantid's got what I've called here a geometry engine. So it's got, um, it's very good at representing uh, lots of different shapes, both for uh, detectors, but perhaps more importantly here for um, samples and sample containers. So we're able to represent shapes using uh, mesh shape descriptions. So this is an example of the um, sample environment pearl instrument at ISIS. Um, we also are able to represent uh, sample shapes using more um, common uh, simple shapes such as cylinders, flat plates, spheres, and we can produce arbitrary combinations of those, including holes of those shapes. Um, so armed with all that shape sort of representation, Mantid's able to calculate track intersections where a straight track goes through one of these complicated sample shapes and it will output all of the uh, intersections between the track and the, the sample edge. Um, I guess by moving the calculation into Mantid, I've fairly easily been able to multi-thread it. So um, for the corrections, um, the, the calculations are typically the same, but just for lots of different detectors. So it's a really nice problem to parallelize. Um, so um, we use OpenMP to do um, things like these parallel for loops, which work quite nicely. Um, Mantid already has um, lots of instrument definitions, which um, automatically tell the calculation where all the detectors are. Uh, and some of the instruments have their sample shapes and sample environment shapes set up. So that's good. Um, and then, yeah, finally, um, we've got some quite nice interpolation functionality in Mantid. So um, uh, some of the high resolution instruments we've got at ISIS have, could have 100,000 sort of pixel sort of detectors in them. So this kind of heavy calculation, doing that per detector could take a very long time. Um, and so um, what I've got, I've put the globe up on screen because we do a kind of a, uh, we've, we've got an optional spatial interpolation feature where you can just do the calculation for a subset of the, of the detectors, and then you can interpolate those, um, those results onto the intervening um, uh, detector positions. So it uses a bilinear interpolation method. Uh, there's also some interpolation method along the sort of uh, bin axis, so uh, the energy axis, let, let's, let's say. Um, and the interpolation will propagate through all of the errors through the interpolation. Um, so you have a nice sort of uh, comprehensive output at the end. Um, so yeah, maybe with detector upgrades going on at the moment, the number of detectors seems to increase all the time. So that kind of functionality is quite useful. Um, right, I'm not gonna dwell on this. I mean, as well as porting it into Mantid, I've added a, a few extra features into the calculation. Um, the one I will pick out is the important sampling. Um, so um, 
one of the risks of this kind of calculation is that you spend lots of simulation time uh, working on tracks that have a zero probability, which are you know, just wasted time. So um, I've added important sampling in, which is kind of a fairly common Monte Carlo uh, technique in order to focus the simulation time on the tracks that are actually more likely. Um, and that um, for you Monte Carlo enthusiasts out there is done using an inversion method, um, which I won't go into now. That's fairly common, but maybe not so common to do it on a 2D function. So that's maybe a little bit uh, different. Um, so I'm um, gonna show you some results in a bit, but before I get onto that, I'm just gonna address one, possible uh, gripe that people may have had if they've been uh, sort of, uh, concentrating hard. So yeah, is this all back to front? Um, so the, the, the calculation as I've presented it is slightly circular. So I, I've suggested that you can do all this great stuff and calculate the scattering effect if you supply this um, SQ omega data set as an input. So this is, the, this is the thing, remember, that tells you how uh, likely a neutron is to be scattered by a certain angle or change energy by a certain amount um, during a scattering event. But yeah, that's, <laughs> that's all well and good, but that's probably what you're actually trying to find out in the experiment. So it's, it's almost the, the simulation is possibly uh, a little bit back to front. So I, I guess my response to that is twofold. Uh, so firstly, um, you can just use the calculation as an investigation tool where you just create hypothetical SQ omega data sets and see what multiple scattering effects they generate. Um, your raw measurement coming off your instrument after it's been reduced, if you just leave the multiple scattering effect in, that might not be a bad guess at what SQ omega is. So you can do uh, things like you can validate whether a lot of common guidelines that people use on neutron experiments are valid. So people will often uh, make their uh, sample small enough such that it will only scatter at the most 10% of the beam. That's a very common rule of thumb that people will use. And they will then say, if that's the case, your multiple scattering is negligible and you can just forget all about this. So um, you can actually validate if that's true. If you know vaguely what your SQ omega function is, you can put it through this calculation and check. Um, and maybe, maybe you don't want your sample to be Know, as small as this general guideline suggests. I mean, on a neutron experiment, the flux may be very low, so maybe you'd like a bigger sample. Um, and number two, all is not lost. You can, you still can perhaps uh, use this as a, a correction and really find out what the actual um, uh, SQ omega function is. Uh, so this might happen if the, the function, if the SQ omega function we're trying to find is, maybe you know everything about it apart from one parameter. Maybe there's just some sort of width that you, on a peak, that is the only thing you don't know about it with theory telling you everything else. That's one way you might be able to work it out. Um, I've also been working on um, an iterative approach where you can um, uh, effectively run the calculation uh, in its standard direction, but you uh, you can maybe uh, use as your starting input for SQ omega some kind of best guess. Maybe it's the raw measurement coming off the instrument, and then you can iteratively um, uh, run this uh, discus calculation using the kind of uh, correction methods I showed on an earlier slide to make the SQ omega better and better until it stops getting better. At which point you finish. Um, so. Um, this iteration scheme, I mean, this, this is perhaps sort of veering into the territory of a reverse Monte Carlo approach, which uh, is something uh, which uh, I think maybe Robert, who spoke earlier on, perhaps pioneered at ISIS. So um, yes, that's maybe something to look into. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a couple of results slides um, just to see what, this, show you what kind of thing this does. Um, so uh, this is for a quasi-elastic uh, experiment. Um, so uh, this is for a water sample and a flat plate. Um, everyone always uses water for multiple scattering uh, uh, presentations for some reason. Um, so the uh, one of the main inputs, uh, apart from the sample shape, is this SQO rigor data set I've been talking about. Um, this whole thing was actually, this is a hypothetical experiment, by the way, and this was, um, an example used by Mike Johnson in his original paper. So the SQ omega data set is quite kind of uh, 
sparse. It doesn't have a huge number of data points. Um, so uh, let me just cut to the chase perhaps and show you what this, this looks like. So uh, middle plots from Mike Johnson's 1974 paper on discus. Solid lines show you the uh, a single scatter intensity at four detectors positioned at four different angles. Um, and the dotted lines show you the double scatter intensity. Um, so without getting into the science very much here, the, the, one of the conclusions is simply that the, uh, the result I got from Mantid on the right hand side does indeed look very similar to the original. So good news. So um, the calculations uh, was done. This is what this is what I call a single bin calculation. So it's um, it's a single uh, incident energy and the same set of tracks are reused for um, all of the different output energy. So um, it means it's quite fast. This is less than a second on a reasonably powerful desktop computer. And interestingly enough, the original Fortran code, even running on the IBM mainframe. Um, uh, there are some performance uh, timings provided in the paper, and that too only took a, 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 maybe not less than one second, but it only took 20, 30 seconds. So the original code was pretty, uh, pretty good. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to go into the observations in direct detail, but yeah, one of the, one of the interesting points uh, is that the multiple scattering intensity is actually bigger than the single scattering intensity at certain points on that graph. See the dotted lines are above the blue one just at the, the extremities. So that's that's kind of interesting. It suggests it's worth worrying about and correcting. Um, secondly, um, for a diffraction experiment, again, I've got a made made up input. Um, so uh, diffraction uh, sort of uh, experiments typically result in SQ Omega functions, which are really spiky. So just to take a an extreme example, I've got one with a single spike. Um, so this suggests the scattering, it's not realistic, but it suggests all the neutrons will only scatter at 60 degrees. That's it. The reason I pick this is that um, it's possible to solve this mathematically. You can say what the double scatter intensity will be. Looks like this. Um, and um, if I run this through uh, Mantid, um, initially I get quite a rough looking result. Um, Without the important sampling turned on, the number of data points in the blue line, which is the main output, it should look like something in the middle plot. Uh, there's a load of tracks have been thrown away at my 10,000 tracks I've generated, so it's quite noisy. Um, but with the um, important sampling turned on, it's not quite the same, but it's close -ish. The blue line is plausibly similar to the, um, the, the, the plot I've got in the middle. The, the right hand peak has been chopped off. Uh, which uh, is because the important sampling isn't absolutely perfect. So I, I don't think it's quite fully converged, but still interesting. Um, and again, it's a single bin calculation, so it runs nice and quickly. Um, so uh, just to, this is my final slide, um, just to talk a bit about what I'm going to do on the future on this. Um, the two hypothetical experiments are all well and good, but um, the data load isn't um, processing load isn't realistic for a real, um, at least not for a, a time of flight diffraction instrument such as we've got at ISIS. So these will have thousands of different energy or time of flight bins. They'll have uh, lots of detectors. This isn't even one of the biggest ones. Um, and um, for this type of simulation, I end up um, the, the code ends up having to calculate a huge number of track intersections. So this is um, the calculating the intersections between the track and the sample shape is the, the slowest bit of the code, having profiled it quite a lot. That's the performance bottleneck. And even that kind of calculation requires 20 billion track intersections. And, so, and on a powerful-ish desktop PC will take something like two hours. So um, that kind of runtime is painful to work with particularly if you're trying to run it as part of an iteration. Um, so yeah, just to uh, shoot to the end slide. So um, one area of uh, future work is that uh, I will probably need to look at the performance of this, either by throwing better hardware at it or by speeding up some of the tracking section code. Um, and yeah, I will uh, 
probably I've already moved on from hypothetical experiments for real ones, uh, and I'm in the process of validating this calculation with some of the ISIS scientists. So um, I will stop there. And the only other thing I'll say is that uh, thank you very much for uh, sticking around until the very end to listen to it. So, yeah, cheers.